it was a time of joy and anticipation. The Allies had won the war. The baby boom was well underway. And a team of scientists and engineers was about to invent the key to the information age. We call it a transistor. Hi, I'm Ira Flato. The transistor was probably the most important invention of the 20th century. And the story behind the invention is one of clashing egos and top secret research. Stick around. Major funding for Transistorized is provided by the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation to enhance our understanding of the world around us and of the increasing role of science and technology in everyday life. Is this on? What we have for you today represents a fine example of teamwork, a brilliant individual contribution, and of the value of basic research in an industrial framework. This cylindrical object, which I'm holding up, is a device that can amplify electrical signals as they are transferred through it. It is composed entirely of cold, solid substances. We call it a transistor. It's June 30th, 1948. Ralph Bown of Bell Labs has announced their latest, greatest, top secret invention to the press. It's designed to replace the venerable vacuum tube. And even though he's up there extolling the virtues of his newest device, he hasn't got a clue of the revolution the transistor will trigger. In fact, no one does. No one could have predicted the sweeping changes such a small object would create in business, education, and culture. No one foresaw how the transistor would take us to other worlds and shrink our own. Bell Labs credited those three men, Walter Bratton, John Bardeen, and William Shockley, with the invention of the transistor. You heard Bound call them a fine example of teamwork. But what Bound didn't say, but which he knew, was that clashing egos and bitter rivalries had already made it impossible for the three of them to ever work together again. They were three men of extraordinary talent and very different personalities. Walter Bratton, the oldest, was an experimental physicist who could build and fix just about anything. Walter was, a, was sort of a marvelous character. Uh, you'd almost say a homespun character in the sense that uh, he, he, his voice was, uh, was sort of a raspy uh, voice and he was very plain spoken. John Bardeen was a theoretical physicist one of the 20th century's greatest. John was a very mild-mannered man. Never raised his voice. Just remember him as being uh, flat. He controlled his emotions. Bill Shockley, the team leader, was the youngest. A brilliant theoretician, he saw the transistor's potential when almost no one else did. His driving ambition would make him a hero and lead to his downfall. He lived a life of competition, that everything he did breathed and, uh, and, and acted competition. It came out of every pore of his being. For a brief period after World War II, the lives of these three would be interwoven, bringing out the best each had to offer, only to unravel under the crushing weight of unbridled ambition. Their story has all the makings of a classic Greek tragedy. When our story begins in 1945, 
Bell Labs had just moved from its cramped headquarters in Manhattan, about 20 miles north of here, to these state-of-the-art laboratories in the rolling hills of New Jersey. Bell Laboratories was the research arm of the giant telephone company, American Telephone and Telegraph, AT&T. By the mid-1940s, AT&T held the monopoly on long-distance telephone calls. And it reinvested its wealth wisely, hiring the country's top scientists and engineers and giving them the very best facilities. AT&T executives understood that basic research gave them a competitive edge. As you might expect, Bell Labs was an incubator of big dreams and even bigger egos sometimes. It had already produced one Nobel Prize winner. It was spinning out patents at the rate of two per day. And it all began with a boast made 36 years before. In 1907, AT&T was in a financial crisis. Alexander Graham Bell's patents for the telephone had expired and thousands of small independent phone companies were nipping at its heels, stealing customers. To recover from its financial tailspin, AT&T called on its former and now retired president, Theodore Vail. Vail quickly announced that AT&T would offer customers what no other phone company could, coast-to-coast -coast telephone service. There was only one problem. Can you recall the telephone of a generation ago? New York to Denver was the longest call that could be made, and it was uncertain. Uncertain because the phone company needed to find some way to boost the signal the rest of the way across the country. But no satisfactory amplifier existed. So Vail set out to build one. He turned to a prolific American inventor from Iowa named Lee DeForest. This electronics pioneer discovered he could make an amplifier by simply putting a metal plate and a bent piece of wire into a light bulb along with its hot filament. It became known as the vacuum tube. In 1906, DeForest found that he could control the flow of electricity from the hot wire to the cold plate by inserting a squiggly little piece of wire between the two. Perhaps you can see it right there in our vacuum tube. The little wire was the key to the vacuum tube's success. This early film explained how it works. These aroused monkeys throwing pebbles at a target through a shutter ably portray what goes on in a vacuum tube. The monkeys are throwing electrons. The shutter in between represents our little wire. It electrically blocks the flow of electrons or lets them through, depending on its charge, like an on-off switch. Simple, isn't it? That squiggly wire called the grid also allowed the tube to be made into an amplifier. Let me show you how that worked. When a weak signal, let's say a telephone call, Watson, come here, I want you, is fed into the grid of the vacuum tube, it modifies the electricity flowing into the tube. It creates an identical but stronger signal coming out. The tube becomes an amplifier. Watson, come here, I want you. Then the vacuum tube went into service, and the transcontinental telephone became a reality. And just as Theodore Vail had promised, on January 23, 1915, the father of the telephone demonstrated AT&T's new coast-to-coast -coast service. Alexander Graham Bell repeated the first words ever transmitted by telephone. Mr. Watson, come here, I want you. But this time, the inventor's assistant laughed. I can't make it under a week, Dr. Bell. I'm in San Francisco. The tube solved the long-distance problem, and telephone lines spread like spider webs across the country. By the mid-1920s, the vacuum tube had come into its own. Vacuum tubes were everywhere. Thousands and thousands of them were powering radios and telephone networks and used in amplifiers all over the world. The problem was, though, that vacuum tubes were big and bulky. They gave off a lot of heat. They used up a lot of power. And like their cousins, the light bulb, they had a nasty habit of burning out. AT&T knew that if it were to meet the demand for increased phone service, it would have to come up with something better than the vacuum tube. And if Bell Labs could produce such a product, 
AT&T stood to make a fortune. In the 1930s, Bell Labs director of research, Mervyn Kelly, understood quite clearly the problems with vacuum tubes. It was Kelly, after all, who recognized that if the telephone business was going to rely on relays and on vacuum tubes, then before long its future progress would be limited by the limitations of those two devices. Kelly thought the answer lay in a strange class of materials called semiconductors, such as silicon and germanium, which could both conduct and resist the flow of electricity depending on the conditions. Perhaps they could be coaxed into doing everything vacuum tubes did only better. But World War II put Kelly's plans for a new semiconductor device on hold as the nation's laboratories turned their talents to winning the war. One of the most important technical developments of the war was radar. Radar helped the Allies see through fog and darkness, track enemy planes and ships, and shoot down buzz bombs destined for London. And radar would play a key role in the invention of the transistor. To detect radar, you needed an element that required semiconductors. It was called a crystal rectifier. And he used this tiny chip of silicon inside to convert the radar signal into something that you could see in a scope. Radar was made possible through research into silicon and germanium, work that would later be essential to the invention of the transistor. At the war's end, the mines and material that once fought Hitler and Hirohita would be mobilized again this time to make consumer products for the returning GIs and their growing family. Well, we that were in the service were very glad to be home. Uh, there was a great expansion going on. The depression was gone, the war was over, and we, everything was just an up curve. Everything kept going. Everyone wanted a piece of the good life. For Ma Bell, business was so good, the company found it hard to keep up. AT&T was swamped with increasing demand for phone service. If the trend continued, quipped one company executive, half the women in the U.S. would have to become switchboard operators. Mervyn Kelly realized that long-distance calls could be routed automatically if a reliable electronic switch could be found. First, he needed to assemble a team of scientists smart enough to make it happen and fast. Kelly knew that other high-tech laboratories were experimenting with semiconductors too, and he did not want to risk losing a patent. Kelly tapped one of his top young physicists, Bill Shockley, to lead the team. Shockley was born in California, the only son of a mining engineer. He loved rock climbing, practical jokes, and British sports cars. And he was deadly serious about his physics. Shockley had phenomenal physical intuition. Uh, he really had a, just a feeling for the way the physics worked in these devices. I had a colleague that said he thought Shockley could see electrons, that his physical intuition was so good. Shockley was a brilliant theorist, but lousy at building experiments. He knew he needed someone who worked well with his hands, just like Bell needed Watson. He found Walter Branton, a seasoned experimental physicist already working at Bell Labs. Raised on a farm in Washington State, the self-reliant Branton was the epitome of American ingenuity. Walter was a very good experimental physicist. He could uh, put things together out of ceiling wax and uh, paper clips, if you wish. Shockley then hired John Bardeen, a brilliant theoretical physicist trained at Princeton University. An expert on the movement of electrons within solid materials, he understood the subtleties of semiconductors. Bardeen was the precocious second son of a medical school dean from Wisconsin. He skipped three grades and entered college at the age of 15. They called him Whispering John. Bardeen was really a quiet, contemplative, very deep kind of person, whereas Shockley was quick. Uh, and that was 
initially very complimentary. He would compliment Shockley's own expertise, and more importantly, with capable John Bardeen in the laboratory, Shockley would be free to work on his own. With those key players in place, Shockley filled out his team with an eclectic mix of physicists, chemists, and engineers, working to attack the problem from all sides, the kind of team that had worked so well during the war. It was an example of uh, very good teamwork, and I have had personal experience in teamwork having been a bomber pilot. And this was the nearest thing that I saw to that. We were well integrated, well focused, and had good direction. And above all, they enjoyed each other's company. There was all kinds of partying that happened, and there was a, it was not at all uncommon for a, uh, for a bunch of folks to go to lunch at Snuffy's down in, uh, in Scotch Plains for, for lunch and, uh, and have a few beers along with the steak that was, uh, uh, was available there. Betty Sparks was Bill Shockley's secretary. Bill, of course, liked uh, tricks. He jacked up the rear end of our getaway car from our wedding party so that the real wheels just spun like mad until everybody out in the front lawn of our home was laughing and getting it back down on ground where we could buzz off to New York City. This song is called Hell's Bells Laboratory. It's a song that was written in uh, the middle 50s and, and sung at various conferences uh, at the time. Written by Ian McIntosh. We've traveled a long way to bring you this song, a brand new calypso we're sure to get wrong about the reform school to which we belong. It's the Hell's Bells Laboratory. It's the Hell's Bells and buckets of blood. It's the Hell's Bells Laboratory. Our walls are all graced by the periodic chart. Shockley's picture is sewn over our hearts. Bodine and Branding are our sweethearts at the Hell's Bells Laboratory. At the Hell's Bells and buckets of blood at the Hell's Bells Laboratory. <laughs> In the spring of 1945, even before the team was complete, Bill Shockley was convinced he knew how to make a semiconductor amplifier. For almost a decade, he had dreamed of being the first to invent one. He had his associates assemble a crude device based on his design and began testing it. Though Bill Shockley was sure it would work, many others thought it was impossible. At the time to do this, is crazy. It's, it's unimaginable because they're so, it's so radically different. There's nothing like this. No one has had anything ever like this. And it's strange. It's, it's got strange ideas and strange behavior and strange data. His idea was to attach a battery to a piece of semiconductor and place a metal plate just above it. Now, normally, electricity won't flow through the semiconductor. But if an electric charge is applied to the plate, Shockley reasoned, the resulting electric field should draw electrons out of the atoms, creating a path for the electricity. He called this the field effect. His experimental device was a small cylinder coated on the outside with a thin film of silicon. He positioned a small metal plate just above it. The theory looked great on paper, but it didn't work. No matter what he did, he could not increase the current flowing through the cylinder. Bill Shockley was stumped. Discouraged, Shockley asked his new employee, John Bardeen, to double check his mathematics. Like Shockley, Bardeen was schooled in the new world of quantum mechanics, where the behavior of subatomic particles as small as electrons could be predicted. Well, Bardeen went over the figures. He couldn't find anything wrong. So why didn't the field effect device work? That's what Shockley wanted to find out. So he assigned Bardeen and his new close personal friend, Walter Bratton, to come up with the answer. Shockley then envisioned himself returning to the laboratory to complete the invention of the transistor. I think he uh, 
was simply giving them a problem that needed to be solved. Once it was solved, uh, then uh, Shockley could go back to the business at hand, which was to actually make it a solid state amplifier. Generally, Shockley had backed off from it and was had enough, enough brains to leave them alone. Uh, whether he did it deliberately or whether this was just a function of his personality, I'm not sure. But essentially, the two of them worked alone. Bardeen thought he understood why Shockley's device didn't work. Simply put, he said that there were things happening on the surface of the semiconductor that was preventing this field from penetrating into the body of the material. Bardeen believed that electrons were trapped on the surface of the silicon, creating a shield so the electric field could not reach the electrons on the inside. The pair set out to understand the mysterious details of this surface barrier. Walter Bratton spent most of his time in the lab, building and conducting experiments. John Bardeen would suggest new experiments and interpret the results. It's John who does the heavy duty thinking and Walter who was a, a very good experimentalist with John around was a great experimentalist and, and, and Walter knew that. Bratton and Bardeen worked very closely but would often call in Shockley and other members of the team for advice. They were embedded in the remarkably productive environment of Bell Labs at Murray Hill in those days. They had access to other people within Shockley's group. They had access to other people outside in metallurgy and chemistry. Uh, and they were perfectly free without any bureaucracy to, to call on help wherever they needed it. Walter Bratton's diary reflects how pleased he was with the team. I cannot overemphasize the rapport of this group. We would meet together to discuss important steps almost on the spur of the moment of an afternoon. We would discuss things freely. Bratton and Bardeen began tinkering with thin slices of silicon, searching for a deeper understanding of the surface barrier. And they started making electrical measurements on the surface of, uh, of germanium and silicon and varying the surface properties to see if they could confirm his theory. They dipped the silicon into liquid nitrogen, figuring this frigid bath might somehow neutralize the shield and allow the electric field to penetrate deeper where it could stimulate the flow of electrons. It worked, but only very slightly. Enough, however, to convince Bardeen his theory was correct. Unfortunately, this early victory was just a tease. Bratton and Bardeen could make no more headway into unlocking the secret of the surface barrier. Winter turned to spring, and spring to summer, summer to fall, and still no progress. With nothing to show for their efforts, tensions mounted, especially between the vocal Bratton and his ambitious boss. Phil Foy remembers one incident in particular. Shockley was at the blackboard in a seminar explaining some complex physical principles. As he got into the explanation, Bratton began to click two quarters in his pocket. Shockley turned to Bratton and said, will you please stop clicking those quarters? Walter, I can't think. Walter commented, well, I can't think unless I'm doing it. Shockley next reached into his pocket and gave him two dollar bills. Said, here, Walter, rub these together. Finally, in the fall of 1947, a sign of progress. Bratton had been struggling with an annoying problem of water condensing on the silicon surface. He could have gone through the time-consuming trouble of drying everything out. Instead, he played a hunch. He thought, well, maybe rather than doing that, I can just dump the whole system in the water or other electrolytes. And so he tried that experiment, and he discovered that under those circumstances, they actually got um, an effect. The experiment worked, much to the surprise of everyone, even when he placed just a drop of water on top of the semiconductor. Apparently, charged particles in the water were migrating down to the silicon and neutralizing the surface barrier. Bratton realized they were onto something big. I'd taken part in the most important experiment I'd ever do in my life. Thus began what Bell Labs would eventually call its miracle month. Bratton and Bardeen were hot on the trail. It seemed like almost every day they were making discoveries 
that brought them closer to overcoming the surface barrier. The device worked even better when they switched from silicon to germanium. But there was still one problem, one that would be especially troublesome for a phone company. It was sluggish, not responsive enough to amplify the complex tones of the human voice. Perhaps the liquid was slowing down the response. Why not just get rid of it? The history of invention is certainly full of serendipitous events, happy accidents. And the key discovery made at Bell Labs in December of 1947 is certainly one of them. Because in his efforts to do away with the liquid, Walter Bratton, almost by accident, stumbled upon the transistor. Bratton had an idea for a new device. Instead of the metal plate, he would substitute a spot of gold and keep it separated from the germanium by a thin oxide film, sort of a rust that sometimes forms on germanium. He hooked it up and nothing happened. No amplification at all. It was as if they had gone back to square one. But they didn't give up. John Bardeen is one of the great scientists of our century. Uh, he had unique characteristics of seizing on a problem and never letting go until he understood it down to the depths and solved it. They kept at it, trying many different combinations of setups and voltages. And shortly before Christmas of 1947, their perseverance paid off. Phil Foy was in the lab that day. Brat was on the opposite side of the room. He had a bench and he had his uh, small microscope. He was actually looking at surface effects and he noticed that he had current gain on that scope. And he let out a, a sentence. It wasn't a loud sentence. This thing's got gain. It turns out that Bratton had accidentally washed away the thin oxide film, so the gold spot was in direct contact with the semiconductor. Instead of a field pulling electrons to the surface, as Shockley had envisioned, Bardeen realized they were injecting positive charges directly into the germanium. And, and things will come your way. And so they actually built the first transistor on an entirely different principle than they had anticipated. It wasn't a field effect amplifier at all. When Bratton actually saw the first transistor effect, it was his deep training to know he had something. He could have missed that, but he, that was the flash of genius. He knew he had something. It was time to turn the experiment into an invention. On December 16, 1947, without discussing their plans with Shockley, the pair began to build a device. Immediately, Bratton encountered a major design problem. The wires touching the germanium had to be extremely close together, and they were very difficult to manipulate. Quickly, Bratton cobbled together an ingenious solution. He wrapped a strip of thin gold foil around a small plastic triangle. Slicing the foil in two at the tip, he created a razor-thin gap. He applied the power, and the device worked. Walter Bratton had just built the first transistor. It was marvelous. It would sometimes stop working, but I could always wiggle it and make it work again. And here you have it, the device that Bratton and Bardeen were so excited about. It's an exact replica, an actual working replica of their original transistor. Here is a slab of semiconductor material, germanium, the same kind of germanium they use in their transistor. It's sitting on a copper base. Power is applied to the bottom of the slab through this copper. The weak signal enters one side, is amplified in the semiconductor, and comes out the output stronger. Bill Shockley was working at home that day. Walter Bratton and John Bardeen decided to call him with the good news. But his response was not what they had expected. Shockley had two emotions. One, he was very pleased because he knew how important it was. And I think he genuinely did like these two people. He was also stunned and angry and disappointed because he realized at that moment that they had done it and he had not. That phone call from Bratton and Bardeen changed Bill Shockley's life forever. His friends said he was never the same. And then there was this remarkable change in character and outlook.
he became more ingrown, intense, and his friends saw less and less of him. His subordinates had just invented the device that Shockley had been dreaming about for years, and they might get all the credit. He would have to do something to get back in the game and do it fast. On New Year's Eve, 1947, just a couple of weeks after Bratton and Bardeen demonstrated their new invention, Bill Shockley was attending a physics conference in Chicago. Ignoring the celebration, Shockley stayed in his room, impatient to put the ideas swimming in his head onto paper. He realized that Bratton and Bardeen's device would be fragile and difficult to manufacture. Shockley would take advantage of these problems. He would invent a better transistor. Bratton and Bardeen's point contact transistor worked this way. One input point, one output point, contacting the surface of the semiconductor. But as you can see, the points can loosen up and the surface of the semiconductor can become marred and useless. Shockley had a better idea. Why not mimic the vacuum tube and create a three, one, two, three layer sandwich? This way we can move the input around to the other side, just like in a vacuum tube. So electricity would flow in the input and come out the output. And in between would be a third layer, just like the grid in the vacuum tube. A small electrical signal coming in the grid would influence a larger electrical current flowing from the input to the output. Voila, just like the vacuum tube. This was a brilliant idea because it made up for the shortcomings of the point contact transistor. And all of this work he did and uh, had it written down in his notebook and witnessed by fellow Bell Labs employees within four weeks of the, uh, certainly within a month of the original invention. That was a extremely productive period. Bill Shockley returned to Bell Labs from Chicago and told no one. He redrafted the idea at home, telling neither Bratton nor Bardeen, keeping them in the dark. It was an insult the two would never forget. The first crack in the harmonious team had been created, a rift that would widen and eventually destroy it. Bratton and Bardeen essentially got pushed aside and uh, we're working on research into the surface into the point contact transistor that Shockley probably knew was a blind alley a dead end. My difficulties stem from the invention of the transistor before that there was an excellent research atmosphere here after the invention Shockley at first refused to allow anyone else in the group to work on the problem in short he used the group largely to exploit his own ideas I could not contribute to the experimental program unless I wanted to work in direct competition with my supervisor. An intolerable situation. A tense situation became even worse when Bell Labs lawyers began writing the patents. Shockley insisted that he be named sole inventor of Bratton and Bardeen's device. Shockley felt that what Bardeen and Bratton had done was derivative of his own ideas. He always thought that the light bulb always went off in one mind. And so he felt that his name should be on the patent all by himself or together with Bardeen and Bratton. But Bell Labs lawyers decided to play it safe. Instead of applying for a patent on Shockley's broad idea of an amplifier made from a semiconductor, they focused instead on Bratton and Bardeen's far more narrow device, it would be easier to defend. And the patent attorneys recognized that, uh, that Shockley had played a role in this, but he actually had not been involved in that experiment. Therefore, they excluded him from the patent. With the patents filed, Bell Labs decided it was time to break the secrecy and go public. But what would they call the new invention? They knew such an important device needed a really good name. 
Walter Bratton sought the advice of his old friend, John Pierce, an engineer who wrote science fiction stories on the side. They'd been describing it in descriptive sentences or a couple of really crazy uh, ideas were put forward. But Walter wanted a meaningful and, but above all, a name that fitted with things. And uh, I provided that. Pierce realized that the new device worked by varying the resistance as current was transferred through it, trans resistance. Then the name should fit in with other things such as uh, varistor and thermistor, uh, which were the names of other devices. And from the, the fitting in with other things and from the idea of trans resistance, I suggested the name transistor. Gentlemen, may I ask you to take your places? And that's what it became. Publicity photos recreating their historic experiments were staged in Walter Bratton's old lab. But as the three men took their places, Bill Shockley sat down center stage in Walter Bratton's seat. Nick Holignac once naively asked John Bardeen whether Bratton liked the photo. John made a pained look at me. And he, and he vigorously shook his head, and he says, no, that's Walter's apparatus, that's our experiment, and Bill, and he didn't say Shockley, he says, Bill didn't have anything to do with it. Bratton later wrote Shockley, expressing his frustration over the picture, the patent, and being cut off from working on the new device. Dear Bill, a few remarks after sleeping on our talk of yesterday. It appears to me that the discovery of the transistor has ruined the best research team I ever had the privilege to work in. I think there was an effort in the beginning to give the credit to the group as a whole. The patent department squelched this. Bell Labs finally broke its silence. And on June 30th, 1948, Ralph Bound, director of research, made his proud announcement to the press at Bell Labs old Manhattan headquarters is a device that can amplify electrical signals as they are transferred through it. The announcement got very little public attention. The New York Times buried it on page 46. Time Magazine placed it in a small section in the Science of the Week. Even engineers thought it was a nice device, but for something that did not need replacing the vacuum tube. The people I was with in the tube lab laughed and they said, that's just a crystal set thing. That's a joke. That's just some little wire sitting on top of a crystal. And that's like our, our old crystal sets. That's not going anywhere. If you want to do real electronics, you go down to, to the storeroom and you get some vacuum tubes, uh, capacitors, resistors, inductors, transformers, and go to work. But one man realized its potential. I think Shockley understood its implications more than any living human being did. Uh, he was predicting things that came true 20 and 30 years later, and nobody else ever came close. Soon, there were others. In a bombed-out department store on the other side of the world, two Japanese engineers saw great business potential in the new invention. When Masaru Ibuka and Akio Morita heard that Bell Labs was going to license the technology for the transistor, the entrepreneurs realized they could use it to make transistorized radios. They recognized the importance of the transistor to things they wanted to do. And they did a wonderful job of building up the capability to manufacture quality transistors in large volume. They gave their little company a new name that would be easy to pronounce in almost any language, Sony. But before they could introduce their revolutionary new radio, the Regency Company, in partnership with Texas Instruments, introduced the TR-1 in 1954, just in time for Christmas. Small enough to fit in a shirt pocket, the TR-1 sold for $49.95, more than three times the cost of a vacuum tube radio. Even so, they sold every one they could make. Other American radio makers followed, but even at 50 bucks each, they couldn't turn a profit. So American companies left the pocket radio business, turning to the far more lucrative military market. Why cut nickels and dimes off the cost of a four-transistor pocket radio 
when military brass were willing to pay $100 or more for one transistor. That left the consumer market wide open for the Japanese, who were forbidden from producing military hardware. Japanese companies soon cornered the transistor radio market. Well, the, the, the public was, was enthusiastic about the transistor when, as soon as transistor radios began to be available, because it, it meant that you could, could carry around something pretty small and, didn't, and the battery would last a while and you didn't have to warm it up, and it was, it was pretty neat. The importance of small portable radios was not lost on Walter Branton. When the first transistor radio came out, which was about three times the size of a pack of cigarettes, his comment on that, he thought we'd really done something because now someone over in the desert that was herding sheep could listen to a radio broadcast. Ironically, the transistors used in radios and most other devices were all improved versions of Shockley's design, patented under his name in 1951. Bratton and Bardeen's transistor was used for a time in the Bell Telephone Network, but barely anywhere else. While Shockley had lost the battle, he had won the war. His name, not Bratton and Bardeen's, would forever be linked with the transistor. I remember my first transistor radio. I used to bring it to school to try to secretly listen to the World Series. We used to plug an earphone into the back and then thread the earphone up our sleeves and hold it in our hand and listen to the score. And in time, a team scored a run, a little yay would go out through the classroom. We thought we were fooling our teachers until they asked for the score. Transistorized and solid state became buzzwords, marketing terms. Transistorized, we didn't know what a transistor did, but we did know that solid state meant state of the art. So anything that was transistorized was not only smaller, but had to be better. The transistor suddenly opened the floodgates of information. Uh, it made it possible for people who had never before been a party to world dramas to be there in a front row seat. This point was driven home to Charles Stewart in 1968 while visiting Bedouin tribes in the Sahara Desert. As the tea was being poured and passed around that my hosts asked me, turned to me and said, why this time are they burning Detroit? And the story then they had to unfold, I didn't know myself, was that I was sitting a few hours away from the moment when Martin Luther King was assassinated. And they themselves had picked this information up, of course, with their transistors from Cairo, from Moscow, from London. The transistor radio had become the first tool of the information age. But by now, the once great team of Shockley, Bratton, and Bardeen had crumbled. Uh, essentially, what happened is Shockley drove them both out of Bell Labs. Certainly drove Bardeen out of Bell Labs. Bardeen went several times to his managers and said, I have to, I have to work without this man. John Bardeen was the first to leave. In 1951, he appealed to his old friend, Fred Seitz, a physicist at the University of Illinois. I went to the dean and said, look, here's your chance to get a, a world beater. And he managed with some difficulty, but by piecing uh, pieces of budget together to make him a reasonable offer. I thought they should have offered him more, but when I mentioned the figure to John, he said, that's enough for me. By 1955, Shockley's reputation as a terrible manager finally caught up with him. It became clear that he would not receive further promotions at Bell Labs. So he decided to leave the East Coast and move west. Let's go surfing now, everybody's learning how, come on a safari with me. This is Palo Alto, just south of San Francisco. It's one of the richest towns in the whole world because it's literally at the center of California's high-tech industry. But back in 1955, 
All of this was just another sleepy little college town, the home of Stanford University. Shockley knew this place well because he grew up here. That's his boyhood home. So he came back for two reasons. One, his mother still lived in town. And two, he knew the warm California weather would help attract the bright, young talent that he needed for his new company. You see, Shockley was famous. Now he wanted to become rich and famous. He began recruiting engineers from Bell Labs for his new company, Shockley Semiconductor. But no one would join. They all knew his reputation. So he looked for others more eager. Shockley had one indisputable talent. He had the ability to spot talent in other people. He did that with his company. He did that at Bell Labs. He was probably the best scientific computer, scientific recruiter of his time. Among the first people Shockley hired were Bob Noyce and Gordon Moore. Years later, they would go on to found Intel. But they got their start working for Bill Shockley. When I first got hired by Bill Shockley, I had no idea what this industry could be. Uh, in fact, uh, I don't think anyone had any idea that it would really change so much of the world. We were just interested in seeing if we could make a transistor that somebody might want to buy. Shockley Semiconductor had been running less than a year when Shockley was awakened by an early morning phone call. Uh, it was somebody from claiming to be from Stockholm, telling him he had just won the Nobel Prize to be shared with John Bardeen and Walter Bratton for the invention of the transistor. And after he got over his initial surprise, uh, he realized it was true. And great celebration erupted. Well, I certainly do remember the day Bill got the Nobel Prize. I never adjourned to start drinking champagne at 9 o'clock in the morning on any other occasion in my life. <laughs> The trio attended the ceremony with their wives and families. Shockley brought his mother. The Swedish Academy called their work, quote, a supreme effort of foresight, ingenuity, and perseverance, exercised individually and as a team. After the ceremonies, John Bardeen and Walter Bratton were sharing a nightcap in the hotel bar. In walked Bill Shockley. They'd changed the world. They'd gone their separate ways. They'd won the most prestigious award in science. And for this night, at least, they'd put their differences aside. It seemed at that point that all of the hard feelings of the past years had uh, kind of evaporated. They were the heroes in Valhalla. They were the, uh, the gods of the field. And a lot of the ill feelings began to melt away. Shockley's celebration was short-lived. Returning to California, he found Shockley Semiconductor in trouble. The company was bleeding money, and history was repeating itself. His prized team of scientists was in revolt. Shockley had in mind a particular device he wanted to have the Shockley Semiconductor Laboratory work on. And the darn thing just wouldn't turn out to be reliable or or uh, economically enough to do the job. But that was Shockley's idea. It was his pet, pet device, and he wouldn't let anybody else work on anything else. He did not want to ha happen in his company what happened at Bell Labs. In other words, two guys going off and doing something monumental. He wanted to make sure that if anything happened monumental, he was going to be the one who was going to do it. After just a year and a half of work, eight of Shockley's best and brightest left to become known in Silicon Valley lore as the traitorous eight. They formed their own transistor company, Fairchild Semiconductor. When we started Fairchild, we had uh, no really good idea where we were going, uh, other than that we wanted to make a silicon transistor. Fairchild and Texas Instruments saw a way of connecting transistors without wires or solder, uh, 
and putting four or more on a single piece of silicon. They called the invention the integrated circuit. And Fairchild came out with the first integrated circuit uh, sold commercially in 1961. And that was really a major change in the direction of the whole industry. And uh, those of you who use your PCs today are the distant beneficiary of that original idea of making a complex circuit in one block of silicon. Shockley hired a new crop of scientists, but he could not replace the one person most responsible for the company's problems himself. If Shockley had been a better manager, he'd be one of the richest people in the world today. He would have been the match for Bill Gates. He is the father of Silicon Valley. He knew better than anybody in the world the importance of these machines, of these transistors. He knew that he was revolutionizing the world. He knew that if his company could, could control the direction the transistor should go toward, that he would be very rich. Bill Shockley never did get rich, but two of the traitorous eight did. Gordon Moore and Bob Noyce eventually left Fairchild Semiconductor to form a little company called Intel, which today is worth billions. Intel makes these silicon wafers. Each one of these little squares is actually a computer chip, the kind you find in your PC. And each square contains four million transistors. So this wafer has about a billion transistors on it. And Intel turns these out by the thousands each day. Many of them are computers, most don't know of the millions of transistors hidden inside each chip. Billions of transistors are now churned out daily by Intel, Motorola, IBM, and other high-tech companies. More transistors are made each year than raindrops fall on California. Ironically, neither Bratton nor Bardeen nor Shockley ever made much money from the transistor. Bell Labs' policy required them to hand over their patent rights for one dollar. And AT&T didn't make much money on it either. It gave up the patent rights as part of its attempt to fend off federal antitrust suits. In 1972, Bill Shockley, Walter Bratton, and John Bardeen returned to Bell Labs for the 25th anniversary of the invention of the transistor. We knew we were onto something very important and that uh, transistors would have many applications. Well, when I was a young man, one considered the only way to save the world was to make everybody litter so they knew how to read and write. But now that the natives in all lands can have a cheap battery-operated transistor radio that they can turn on at night in their camp and listen to any broadcast in their own language, whether they know how to read or write or not. And we were looking for, uh, for transistors at the same time that we were paying attention to those things that prevented the first field effect form from working. Bell Labs asked them to recreate their famous photograph. Letting bygones be bygones, Bratton and Bardeen agreed. Walter Bratton retired from Bell Labs in 1967. His only regret was that his invention helped stimulate rock and roll. He returned home to Washington State and taught college physics. He died in 1987. John Bardeen won a second Nobel Prize in 1972 for his work on superconductivity. He was the first person to win two Nobel Prizes in physics. John Bardeen died in 1991. Bill Shockley became a professor at Stanford University. He again made headlines in the 70s and 80s for his controversial theories on race and IQ. Bill Shockley died in 1989. Our story ends here in Silicon Valley, 3,000 miles and many decades away from where we began. Apricots used to flourish here before transistors. And today, this is the place of big dreams and even bigger egos. And who knows, perhaps inside one of these plush corporate campuses, some young scientist or engineer is perfecting the next device
that will even make the transistor obsolete and revolutionize the world in ways that even we cannot imagine.